IB Physics SL. Topic 7, Atomic, Nuclear, and Particle Physics. Section 7.1, Atomic Physics. Atomic theory dates back to ancient civilization. In India, in the 8th century BCE, the Vedic sage Aruni proposed that particles too small to be seen mass together in the, into the substances and objects of experience. In Greece, in the 5th century BCE, the philosopher Democritus proposed that all matter was composed of small, indivisible particles called atoms. He said that it is impossible to keep dividing matter for infinity, and that matter must therefore be made up of extremely tiny particles. Much, much later, in 1803, the English chemist John Dalton laid out his atomic theory. This theory includes the ideas that elements are made of extremely small particles called atoms, that each element is made up of atoms that are identical to each other, and that different elements are composed of different atoms. It also includes that atoms cannot be subdivided, created, or destroyed. And he also describes how atoms interact with each other to form chemical compounds and how they behave in chemical reactions. It isn't until the end of the 19th century that we really get a view of what's going on inside the atom. In 1897, through his work studying cathode rays, English physicist J.J. Thomson discovered the electron. He proposed that, in order for atoms to remain neutral, the electrons must be distributed in a uniform sea of positive charge. This was referred to as the Plum Pudding Model. A few years later, the model of the atom was refined by the English physicists Ernest Rutherford and Ernest Marsden and German physicist Hans Geiger. Through their experiments bombarding thin metal foils with alpha particles, they discovered that the positive charge of the atom was concentrated in a tiny central nucleus. Soon after... Danish physicist Niels Bohr proposed that electrons orbit the nucleus in specific circular orbits of fixed energy, and that in order to move from one orbit to another, the electron must absorb or emit light of a specific energy. After that, the electron cloud model was developed, based in part on work by Austrian physicist Erwin Schrödinger and German physicist Werner Heisenberg in the 1920s. This modern model of the atom describes the positions of electrons in an atom in terms of probabilities. An electron can potentially be found at any distance from the nucleus, but, depending on its energy level, exists more frequently in certain regions around the nucleus than others. While this is the most accurate description of what's actually going on in an atom, it's not necessarily the most practical model for us to work with. We will be dealing with the Bohr model. In order for us to continue in our study of atomic physics, we have to understand the quantum model of light. As we've already learned, light sometimes exhibits wave behavior. When light diffracts or interferes or is polarized, it is behaving like a wave. But the way that light interacts with atoms shows that light can also exhibit particle behavior. Light as a particle is called a photon, and each photon contains a specific quantity or quantum of energy. The energy of a photon is directly proportional to its frequency. This relationship can be seen in the equation E equals HF, where E is the energy of the photon, H is something called Planck's constant, and F is the frequency of the photon. Planck's constant is named after Max Planck, who was a German physicist and the originator of quantum physics. Let's take a look at a simple example using this formula. What is the energy of an ultraviolet photon with frequency 4.20 times 10 to the 16 hertz? Well, it's as simple as plugging in Planck's constant, which can be found on the data booklet, and the frequency of the photon in the problem, and finding their product. The energy of this photon will be 2.78 times 10 to the negative 17 joules. Other times we might want to relate the energy of a photon to its wavelength, so if we combine the equation E equals HF with the equation for the speed of a photon, we can get the equation lambda, or wavelength, equals HC over E, right? That's Planck's constant times the speed of light 
in a vacuum divided by E, the energy of the photon. Let's take a look at this. What is the energy carried by a photon of wavelength 650 nanometers? Right, we can rearrange that new formula so that it's E equals HC over lambda. We plug in two constants in the numerator, Planck's constant and the speed of light in vacuum. We divide it by the wavelength of the light in meters, and we get an energy for this photon of 3.06 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. As you can see, the energy of photons is quite small. So instead of joules, the energy of a photon is often measured in units of electron volts. An electron volt is defined as the amount of energy gained by an electron that is accelerated from rest through a potential difference of one volt. If we use our potential difference formula from electricity and magnetism, we can see that the work done on an electron of charge 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs passing through a potential difference of one volt is, of course, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules, which is the definition of one electron volt. The aspect of atomic physics that we are primarily concerned with is the transition of electrons between energy levels. Here are two representations of the energy levels for the electron in a hydrogen atom. The lowest energy level is described as the ground state and is given the label n equals 1, and the higher energy levels are labeled with increasing integers. Each energy level has an associated energy, usually described in electron volts. The diagram on the right is a little more abstract, but the way that the energies are described for these energy levels is what is typical. You'll notice, I hope, that each energy is described as being negative. It's not that an electron could possibly have negative energy. Instead, the energies listed for each energy level describe how much energy the electron would need to absorb in order to become ionized or to escape the nucleus. More on that in a minute. An electron can make a transition between energy levels when it absorbs or emits a photon. The energy of the photon must be exactly the same as the difference between the energy levels. Let's take a look at an example. Imagine we have the electron in a hydrogen atom making a transition from energy level n equals 3 to n equals 2. We want to determine the energy and the frequency of the photon that is emitted when that transition takes place. First, we have to find the difference in the energies of those two levels. One way to do this is to take the energy of the level it's starting in and subtract the energy of the level it's going to. In this case, we have negative 1.51 electron volts minus negative 3.40 electron volts. This gives us positive 1.89 electron volts. So the energy of the photon that is emitted when the electron transitions from n equals 3 to n equals 2 is 1.89 electron volts. But if we want to do anything else with that, we have to convert it to joules. So 1 electron volt times 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules per electron volt yields us a photon of energy 3.02 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. Now that we know the energy of the photon in joules, we can use the equation E equals HF, to solve for the frequency. The frequency, of course, would be energy divided by Planck's constant. And if we take our 3.02 times 10 to the negative 19 joules and divide it by 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds, we get a frequency of 4.56 times 10 to the 14 hertz. And there we have it. Let's talk about ionization again. So the highest energy level is often referred to as the ionization level. In this context, ionization is referring to when the atom becomes positively charged due to the electron gaining enough energy to be separated from the nucleus. This can happen if the electron absorbs a photon with energy equal to or greater than the difference between its original energy level and the ionization level. If the electron absorbs a photon of greater energy than is required, the leftover energy will become the kinetic energy of the electron. Let's take a look at an example to make sure that makes sense. So let's say we have an electron in energy level n equals 4, and it absorbs a photon of energy 1.1 electron volt. We want to know with what speed will the electron be moving after ionization occurs. 
So the energy associated with the level n equals four is negative 0.85 electron volts. This means that the electron requires 0.85 electron volts of energy to reach ionization. This means that the energy the electron has after ionization will be equal to the energy of the photon, 1.1 electron volts, minus the amount of energy that was needed for the ionization in the first place. In this case, the electron will have a leftover 0.25 electron volts. In order to do any other physics calculations with this energy, we need to convert it to joules. We can do this by multiplying by 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules per electron volt, yielding us 4.0 times 10 to the negative 20 joules. Of course, this is a pretty small energy, but the electron is a very, very uh, low mass particle. So that much kinetic energy can equate to a reasonable amount of speed. And we can use that energy in the kinetic energy formula, E equals one half mv squared. And when we do that carefully, we find that the velocity of the electron after ionization will be 2.96 times 10 to the five meters per second. One of the practical applications of understanding how electrons make transitions in various atoms is that we can use their emission and absorption spectra to identify those elements in nature. Let's take a look at emission spectrum first. So a hot gas will contain electrons in energy levels above the ground state. Eventually, these electrons will fall to lower energy levels, emitting photons of specific energies and frequencies in the process. Here's the emission spectrum of hydrogen. Because there are a finite number of possible transitions for the electron in a hydrogen atom, there are a finite number of photons that can be emitted when even all of those transitions are happening at the same time in a gas containing a, an incredibly large number of hydrogen atoms. Only four of the possible transitions in a hydrogen atom have energies that are equivalent to frequencies of visible light. This essentially is the fingerprint of hydrogen. As atoms become larger and get more complicated, so do their emission spectra. For example, here are the emission spectrums of oxygen, carbon, and nitrogen. Each of them has many more possible frequencies emitted than hydrogen because they're more complex atoms. What's important to note is that they are all unique. Just like forensic scientists can identify a person by their unique fingerprints, a physicist can identify the presence of an element uh, based on its emission spectrum. The opposite of an emission spectrum would be an absorption spectrum. As light passes through a gas, some of the photons, the ones that match the electron transitions of the atoms of the gas, will be absorbed by the atoms and then emitted and then reabsorbed and then re-emitted and then reabsorbed and so on and so on. In that way, the light that passes through the gas and is then observed will be missing certain frequencies of light that were basically trapped by the gas. These are essentially the inverse of the emission spectra. Here are some examples for hydrogen, helium, and oxygen. I'll leave you with this example of an absorption spectrum. This is the absorption spectrum of our sun. Each of the lettered dark lines corresponds to an electron transition of an element that's present in the atmosphere of our sun. For example, absorption line A is due to an absorption that happens because of the presence of oxygen in the sun's atmosphere. Similarly, C is caused by the presence of hydrogen, D is caused by the presence of sodium, and so on and so forth.